All right, welcome to the next episode of Static Feedback. Uh, I'm a big fan of very opinionated static site generators. Um, and that's what we have today with Quartz. Um, we have the creator of Quartz, Jackie Zell, here with us today. Welcome. Hey, yeah, awesome to have you on. Thank you for having me. Of course. I, I want to start off with this idea of, uh, I, I was reading the philosophy of behind oh, nice. Quartz. Uh, in this digital garden and you introduced me to this idea and I thought it was really cool. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what a digital garden is and, and how that kind of inspired Quartz? Yeah, yeah. I, I can start with a little bit of history, which I think is really interesting. Let's it's it. like, I think 20, 2018, I was like, I saw a lot of people putting up blogs, right? And I, I like, up until that point, I had a lot of trouble publishing online. I think there's a, like a very big fear of like, oh, what I publish online should be good and representative of my thoughts. But as a person who is like very actively consuming like media information and a bunch of other stuff, it's like, I don't know. I feel like my opinions and thoughts changed a lot. And if right. I like had wrote any particular thing, that piece or article would have been out of date in like a few months at most. So it's like, well, th that's kind of how I justified it to myself that like, I didn't need to really publish or, or write anything because, oh, if it's going to be out of date anyways, what, what use is it? Um, at some point, I'd kind of come across this concept of digital gardening, which has like a much more maintenance and incremental based approach to note taking, where it's like you don't, uh, you kind of tend to your notes and your writing as if it were an active garden with things in various stages of growth. Um, and kind of acknowledging that, you know, what is on the website isn't necessarily finished, um, mm -hmm. but it's in a sort of chaotic, messy state. And it, it being in that messy state kind of induces new sorts of growth. Uh, I could talk a little bit more about like the information architecture of digital gardening after, which I think is also quite interesting. But I think overall, it kind of reduces this pressure to like get everything right the first time. Mm -hmm. um, it has this very much like a work in progress mentality that I think really helped me get over that fear of like publishing stuff to the web for the first time. Um, and I've, I've talked with a lot of friends who've kind of had a similar approaches where it's like, oh, it's like, if it doesn't have to be perfect when I publish, then I can just produce more of it. Um, there's this like really fun metaphor I, I really like come back to about how like a pottery instructor was kind of like did an experiment with his two classes he was teaching. Um, and like one class he told that it, the student's final grade would be determined solely by the quality of the last pot that they made. Um, and the second class, the, the total grade would purely be based on the volume of pots that they threw. Um, and, you know, surprisingly, the second class uh, ended up throwing much better pots, even though the, there was no explicit mention of quality. Mm. And I think very similar note about like, just being able to have the freedom to not be shackled by perfection and to just like produce more output ultimately helps you write better and think more clearly. Yeah. Amazing. I, I read something recently, like a philosophy about that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it first, it's just that you do the thing, then you do it better. And like, then you work on perfecting it. And I think it's so easy to get caught up in something new that you're, you're just trying to get it perfect and with writing, get the words exactly right. And that, you just have paralysis where um, yeah. it becomes such a chore that you don't do it. Yeah, yeah. The hardest part often is just getting started, right? <laughs> That's it. And I, I think I think the, the web used to be this weird and wonderful place and we've lost a lot of that because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, like just that perfection and uh, it's like what looking at someone's Instagram feed and everything's perfect, but... Uh, the weird stuff is the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely feels like it's lost a lot of its its whimsy, right? It's like a lot of people just used to make sites for random stuff, like a birthday party for a friend or whatever. And uh, website production has become very like highly commercialized and mm -hmm. just like mostly you know designed by companies or brands or whatever. But I think there's like a there's like a tiny like revival of people who think about web as a poetic form, which I think is really interesting and like expressions of self. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been really cool. And I think the, one of the neat parts about static site generators in particular, I think one of the really things I really wanted to try to enable with courts is like, even for non technical people, it shouldn't like not knowing how to be technical or how to code shouldn't stop you from 
making a website. Um, and at the same time, I don't think you should be boxed into, you know, the same templates everyone uses on WordPress or whatever. Right? Mm. So I think that, that, that philosophical aspect of it's like, um, static site generators are, are a tool to help people express themselves on the web mm. um, and, and making that, oh yeah, sorry. go ahead. Uh, how does, how does that, what does a static site generator do that allows that freedom compared to like a WordPress template? Yeah. So with a WordPress template, it's very much, um, you can customize a lot, but most of them, it's like, if you want to do something in WordPress, somebody had to write a specific guide to do it in WordPress. Mm. Um, I think the thing with static site generators in more broadly is that they're pretty well hooked into web, re like other resources. So I think the the kind of like way to think about it is if you had like a, a graph about like um, on the x-axis was like how complex the task was at hand and the y-axis is like how easy it is to do that task in that framework. Um, with with WordPress, it's kind of like that graph start stops like halfway upwards. Like there's a limit to the complexity you can make with the WordPress site, but generally up until that point it is quite easy to mm. um and i think the real the real power of static site generators is it allows that full freedom of uh complexity because you're effectively hooking into the same web technologies that any like website effectively uses um and allowing end users to kind of scale up that that complexity as they grow with it i think is a really powerful um uh, way to kind of design for systems that you know it's like it works and it works well for ideally everyone that wants to use it and how they want to use it. Um, like one of the big parts of the course philosophy is like, like one, yes, like non-technical people should be able to use it and still get good value out of it. But people who really know what they're doing and want to like hack and really customize the hell out of it really can like go ham with it. Yeah. No, I think, I think I, I completely agree with you. Like in, in a WordPress template world, you're kind of stuck in the bounds of whatever that template is. Whereas with a static site generator, either you can use very simple HTML or very complex. It's like you have the whole spectrum available to you. And yeah, that's mm -hmm. what makes it so powerful. So let's yeah. get to the beginning of courts. So, so you, 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 are working on these ideas of digital gardening. What, what led you to, to starting this project? Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, this was like a 2020 project, I think. At that time, I was like revising my personal site. Up until that point, it was like a, I think it was a Hugo-based blog. Mm. Um, and I had started using, using Obsidian at the time. Uh, I think the, the way that I had been structuring posts before that was very much like traditional blog style. You kind of just have a list of content and each content is a clickable piece of like an article or something. Um, as, and then I started using Obsidian and kind of really reading a lot of the philosophy about digital garden design, especially as that's reflected in information sciences. At, at that time I was still in school and I had taken quite a few courses on information sciences and how we organize information. And one of the, the kind of metaphors that really stuck out is like, why is like the way we kind of index information still very much akin to the file cabinet, right? Mm. It's like you kind of have this like flat index of files that doesn't isn't really conducive to helping you. Like A isn't conducive to really helping you find what you're looking for, um, unless it's like by alphabetical. <laughs> um, or and B, it's like there's no real like semantic links between um, what is being presented. And Obsidian kind of really like turned that on its head in, in the sense that it kind of like explicitly uh, is about like emergent ontologies about like oh, how you organize information is emergent based off of how you link stuff and tag stuff rather than trying to explicitly structure it in folders or indexes. Um, and I think that like really was powerful for me because the way my brain works, this is very associative. Um, I don't, when I write something, I don't usually think about like, oh, this belongs in this folder or this tag or whatever. I kind of write it and let that piece take me wherever um, and then try to figure out how to classify it afterwards if it even needs to be classified. 
Um, and I, f I find that helps me kind of make a lot more cross-disciplinary observations that, you know, if you kind of bin yourself into a specific topic ahead of time, it kind of prevents you from making. So in doing so, kind of like, how do I create a static site generator that, or like use a static site generator that uh, kind of works out of the box with something that's more interlinked like Obsidian. Um, and at the time there was not really any like alternatives to Obsidian publish. Like there was a lot of stuff around, oh, here's how to publish Markdown as a, as a site, but none of it really had any like Obsidian native features. Like a lot of them didn't have search out of the box. A lot of them don't like, they don't have notions of backlinks or uh, like a graph of interconnected notes or anything like that, which uh, I think it was like, to me, it was like a nice to have feature. And most of the, importantly, it was like being able to cross link and backlink across my notes. Um, and I was a stubborn student at the time, didn't want to pay $7 a month. So I was like, I'm gonna <laughs> instead spend a hundred hours and make this myself. <laughs> so um, yeah, at that point, I just like spent a lot of time trying to make my own. Um, it was the first iteration was core, of course was built on top of Hugo. It wasn't like a, it was like a theme on top of Hugo effectively. So it wasn't like a particularly um, inventive static site generator, but it did its job. Um, and I think, yeah, i like posted it to product hunt at some point and no one really saw it. <laughs> um, but I think it was like a, something that people search for enough that the growth was kind of organic in that a lot of people kind of picked it up over time. Mm. What were people looking for? What were they searching for? Yeah, it was like Obsidian published free alternatives. So, ah, I see. Um, <laughs> a lot of people kind of come from that background of like, um, I need something that works like Obsidian, but I don't need to pay for it. <laughs> Which I think at the end of the day, like a lot of open source software kind of comes down to that. Either you're like very like two camps, it's like one you're very philosophically inclined to, I like only use open source software or whatever. Um, or two, it's like, I don't want to pay. I'm just going to use what's free and available. Um, that tends to be open source software. Yeah. So, so let's, so you started with the Hugo template um, hmm. and then transitioned to, to Quartz 4, which is a complete rewrite. What were, what were you finding? What, yeah, what, tell me the story behind that. Yeah. So, I think it's a combination of two things. Like one, I was like a significantly less experienced programmer when I first made courts initially. And I made a lot of like dubious architectural decisions, I think that made it really hard to kind of scale as features were added. Um, so there's a bunch of things around like how backlinks were resolved. For example, there was like three different ways of re representing a URL. Um, and sometimes like you would mistake one for another, but you wouldn't be able to tell when or why. <laughs> mm. um, and Hugo is also famous for not having the greatest error messages when it's like fails to parse something. Um, and especially for something like courts where it's like not all it's, I have a large non-technical user base um, to them. That's like, you know, uh, it's Latin to them, right? It, yeah. it, it, if I see like nil cannot be transformed, fingerprinting failed or something like that, it's like uh, hell if I know, I think yeah. courts is broken. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, so a lot of it kind of comes down to like end user um, usability. It's like, how do I reduce the friction from going from like, hey, I want to make a website or from my notes and publish it to actually doing it as possible. So the kind of course rewrite focused uh, mostly on that. The second like reason I did the rewrite was to kind of enable more end user extensibility. Uh, courts three was based in Hugo and Hugo's templating logic is using uh, Go templates, mm -hmm. which um, are kind of difficult to reason about logic wise, just the the way that they kind of do uh, like pass around information between like partials of templates um, makes it difficult for someone who hasn't used Go templates before to kind of reason about and contribute meaningfully. Uh, so there's a lot of cases where it's like, experienced programmers wanted to contribute something back to courts, but like weren't able to get up to speed fast enough to kind of justify that for themselves. Um, so explicitly part of courts was course four was to choose a more like common tech stack that more developers would be familiar with. So in that sense, it's pretty much only using pure like node and TypeScript. Um, and it's been really cool to kind of see it's like 
the amount of con like community contributions that we've gotten from the community since rewriting the four um, has been really, really positive, even if it hasn't been that long. We already have like a community plugins uh, channel in our Discord and about people just kind of writing their own components and uh, like plugins for other people to use and share, which is really cool. That's awesome. Like, what, what are some of the cool plugins you're seeing coming out of the community? Yeah, I remember there was like a D and D related one uh, to help. Like, I know there's a specific type of syntax that a lot of D and D players like use for formatting images and cards, like information cards. Uh, another one was for like GitHub, like a comment section. Like, of course, it doesn't come with a comment section by default, but mm. people are like, I want a comment section on my blog, and then someone wrote a component for it. Uh, so a lot of really just like fun desired features. Uh, there was also, um, yeah, someone added like a breadcrumb component to kind of help you navigate that. And one of our community members, Ben, um, was like, yeah, I really wish Chords had a file explorer to kind of just like mm. show you all the files that were there. It's like, I personally didn't use a file explorer, so I didn't implement it. But then he was like, took it upon himself to write, write like a 1400 line plugin and contribute that back to the main courts. And yeah, it lives there now, which is really cool. I think one of the beautiful parts about like open source is like people kind of um, take parts of their own workflow that they know other people want and kind of kind of contribute that, that to the main repository so that anyone in the future that has a similar request can kind of look there as well. Um, oh, there's also another one about like Ox Hugo. Um, there's like you know, people who use org roam, which I actually hadn't really heard about it until this year. Um, just yeah, another note taking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Org, org Roam is uh, another uh, note taking software. It's like Roam as its own independent thing. Um, and let me, let me double check. I don't want to. I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so it's an, I think it's an Emacs based. Yeah, it's an Emacs based uh, note taking system that is has similar features to Rome in that it's mostly like a bulleting outlining type mm. um, note taking system. Um, but it's like it's like a super set of markdown, but it uses a completely different syntax than Obsidian. Uh, so even though Quartz was made uh, for Obsidian, the way that the plugins were structured made it really easy for someone to kind of write a transformer plugin for this entirely new note taking app and be able to deploy notes that they take using that app using Quartz, which I thought was really, really cool. Yeah, and that's the, yeah, as you say, it's the power of open source and, and having a community around your project. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that's amazing. Um, so before you were mentioning the, the um, like data structures and kind of the thinking behind a, a digital gardening, how, yeah, what does that look like beneath the hood, and 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 how does it differ from a typical, uh, like chronological kind of based uh, SSG? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's, I think like three distinct ways you could probably classify like information organization and static, or just like most note taking apps actually. Um, like one is chronological. I think most of the time chronological is not the main display format for a website, unless it's just like a standard blog. Yeah. Um, the second one is folder based. Um, so a lot of note taking apps like notion, um, uh, and, uh, I think this, yeah, there's, I'm forgetting them off the top of my head, but the, the, all, most of the main popular, like note taking apps that students use are. Um, like hierarchical tree shaped. So if you think about there's like one main home folder and then kind of everything's out from uh, spans outward from that. Um, and then last but not least, you kind of like graph based uh, organization systems where there's no really like one central node and they kind of all like, there's a pretty messy set of links back and forth. Uh, so those are kind of like the three like main organization systems that I think blogs kind of come, come down to um, sorry, what was the original question about the data structures? Just how, um, what's different in the graph-based ones uh, mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. a chronological or a folder-based? Um, like I imagine, I imagine your data structures are quite different and there's different challenges yeah. there. 
Yeah, I think the only main difference is that the graph-based ones have backlinks. So um, most folder-based ones are like, you can see what are the outgoing page links from some, some, some given page, but you can't see what nodes connect you to the current page you're on. Um, so kind of enabling that back and forth uh, ability. I think the, the only like real main difference is, is in how you like navigate and organize, uh, navigate your information and also um, browse notes uh, when you are actively using the tool. So for more folder based ones, or even chronologically, you kind of have to have a mental idea of like, if I'm looking for a note, I need to know roughly what time I wrote the note to be able to find it uh, effectively. Um, with chronological or with folder based ones, you kind of need to know the rough like groupings for each thing. So you can kind of think about it as like a, a set of um, kind of like not even concentric circles, but like you have this like largest group, which is like everything that is linked outwards from your original like root node um and then a bunch of folders so it's like okay within this folder here are the other notes that i have within it um and to find any particular note you kind of roughly need to know the chain of folders to be able to find any particular note um whereas with graph-based approaches you kind of need to know like oh roughly what is in the neighborhood of that idea uh and then be able to look across the links to figure out um based off the neighboring links um where uh, how to how to navigate to that mm. so it's very much like a the graph based one is like you get close and then kind of inch your way towards where the right place is um with folder based approaches it's a very like binary search type approach where it's like at every level you need to make a decision about uh where the next correct place is to find it and if you make a mistake it's very hard to kind of backtrack it um and chronological you actually need to explicitly pretty much know what you're looking for all the time um, the kind of like larger scale, like an observation out of all of this is that they're not all mutually exclusive actually. Um, and graph based approaches can use folders, for example, like obsidian supports folders by default and chords, for example, supports like a chronological output of, mm -hmm. uh, your notes. So they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, I think they're quite complementary, right? It's like certain notes, for example, like I write a yearly reflection and I know that uh, if I want to look for something by roughly what time I wrote it, uh, that's like the easiest way for me to find that note. Um, so I will often use like a timeline based view for that. Um, so they're all kind of complementary and, and help each other out. And I think the largest uh, unifying feature that kind of brings them all together is good search. Um, being able to have good search really makes a difference in helping you uh, like find what you're looking for. Um, they kind of in the graph based approach is like a, a hack to kind of get you as close to that point that you're looking for as you can. Um, and actually all three cases, right? Like having approximate good fuzzy searches like gets you most of the way for there. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. So in, um, I, I guess that's why you mentioned in Quartz 4, you overhauled how the uh, like linking, the permalinks worked. Uh, you know, that's critical because there's so many links uh, between everything. H how does that work in practice in courts? Like, how are you making a link from one piece of content to another? Are you tagging it or is it based on the content or, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so there are three sorts of major... Okay, so the link has an underlying concept and there's multiple ways you can link between notes as supported by Obsidian, I guess. Um, the, the, the link as a concept is, is uh, it's a directional. If you kind of think about like all the notes in your site um, individually as nodes, um, links are the edges between nodes. Um, and these are directed edges so that you can say, you can see that like uh, note A linked to note B, but it's not necessarily true that B linked back to A. Mm -hmm. Um, so the data structure that Quartz uses is there's, uh, there's a links field for each note. That is all the outgoing links for um, each note. Um, and then there's a content indexer plugin that kind of collates all of that into a big JSON blob that's like, okay, here is each node and here are the nodes that this, link, uh, this node links out to. Um, that's 
effectively the only like data structure we use to represent links. Um, the, the kind of really hard part about this is transforming the concept of links across the different like specifications of like how to locate a note. Um, when you initially author content on your hard drive or computer, the way you locate it is by the file path. Um, but the file path isn't something that can be represented in the browser because there's a lot of legal file paths that are not legal URL paths. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, this process in static site generation is called slugifying. Mm -hmm. So you turn uh, a file path into a slug uh, by normalizing some of the characters out um, or transforming them in some way so that it is a, ends up being a valid string. Um, so this is really funny because in pretty much every other static ge site generator I know, like they're all just string types. But I think that's actually pretty inaccurate to kind of describe a, a URL path versus um, versus like a, a file path is like the same type of string. Um, so in in TypeScript, you, there's no way you can kind of enforce that normally uh, without using something called nominal types, which is a way of saying like, oh, this is a, a special type of string that you can't use in place of other strings. Um, so by using this nominal typing system, we kind of get strongly typed strings so that you can't accidentally pass in like a URL based path uh, into some function that only accepts a file path. Um, and that gives us a lot of typing, like nice typing guarantees when people are writing plugins. Mm. So they don't accidentally pass in uh, like one type of path in for another. Interesting. Um, It'd be so easy yeah. to do as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot of the really like gnarly nitty gritty stuff that, with, that made Quartz 3 really hard to deal with is like, Oh, like some types of paths end with like trailing slashes, for example. It's like when do you treat that differently versus not? And there was like a large library or like this long string I would use to sanitize every time I mentioned a URL, every time in Quartz 3, uh, that just like became really unwieldy. And no one, yeah, there's a lot of really weird regex in mm -hmm. <laughs> Quartz 3 that I'm glad we moved away from for Quartz 4. But uh, yeah, paths are hard, linking is hard. Um, a lot of the stability that Quartz 4 brings is just like making sure that all the links and URLs are consistent. Yeah, no, I, I mentioned that will save, save so many headaches. Um, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about some of the other interesting features in Quartz. Like I was just reading about the uh, single page web app functionality that just kind of comes for free. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about how that works? Yeah, for sure. So normally when you navigate pages on the web, what you're doing is where you're requesting a specific resource from a web page uh, from, from the server. So like most cases, it's an HTML file. And that HTML file comes uh, with links to CSS, which styles the page, and JavaScript, which adds interactivity to the page. Um, and normally what your browser does is when you click on another page, it unloads all the current resources on the current page and then requests the new resource and then loads that new page. So some, this is like why sometimes when you go to certain websites and you click on the links, you get this white flash before your content actually loads. Um, and as a user, it's like it's not ideal if you're only if you're navigating pages within the same site that have the same roughly the same styling and same like interactivity. And one of the really like great parts about uh, like Quartz content is that every page roughly looks like every other page with the exception of the content, <laughs> um, which really lets us do some uh, like pretty like creative hacking to allow us to kind of um, avoid the extra fetching and reloading step. So SPA stands for like single page app. And uh, Quartz has this feature that allows you to turn this multi-page application, which most static site generators produce by default and turn it into like a single page application type experience. So if you ever used an application that was written in like an SPA framework, like React, for example, you'll know that it doesn't, when you navigate between pages, you're not actually requesting a resource. What React is doing under the hood is getting the contents of the new page and replacing your current page with the content rather than kind of going and re reloading that on the browser side. So we've kind of done something similar with Quartz, even though Quartz doesn't actually like use React or deliver any React payload. Um, it uses this really neat library by, um, I think, Nate Whitmore? I don't remember his last name, but he's the guy who made Astro. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff. I would really respect uh, 
made a lot. Um, and so he made this really cool library called uh, Micromorph, which is a really tiny tool to kind of take one HTML document and another HTML document, and you pass the two documents into a function, and it kind of merges the two together to produce the second document from the first document. Um, and Quartz uses this when you, every time you click on a link that is within Quartz, it, under the hood, goes and fetches the content of the other page and then replaces your current content and re-executes the uh, any relevant JavaScript. Um, so it kind of gives you really, really happy page loads um, that makes it like feel very cohesive to kind of uh, navigate between websites. Uh, and it was really funny because in Quartz 3, people were like, oh my god, you should use Quartz because it feels so nice and fast. And people were like, it's because you use Hugo, right? <laughs> uh, and then there was a really confused user one day that was like, how come Quartz is so fast, but Hugo's main website is not? <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, that's the SBA doing the work there. Yeah, it's so noticeable. Like, because you don't really expect it from that type of website to have that SPA experience, but it mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. feels very, very snappy. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like especially important when you're navigating across a lot of nodes and you're trying to keep them in full context, right? The longer, the longer it takes for a page to kind of transition to the other one, it's like the more context you have to keep in your head at any given moment. Yeah. yeah. Yep. No, that's it. What 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 are some interesting and, and cool use cases you've seen from the courts community? Yeah. Um, I'm surprised by the number of educators that use it. Um, it's, I think, a really popular tool for teachers who make course syllabi. Um, I've seen a lot of like math and chemistry teachers kind of use courts to make their like homework and, and notes pages kind of all in one so that all of their assignments, it's like, oh, if you link to a concept that I've mentioned in the lecture, it's very easy for you to kind of go and reference that. Mm, um, really cool. It's really neat. Yeah. And there was, yeah, like Robert Heisfield, Joel Chan, and I forget who the other author is, but some folks recent uh, about a year ago, did like a research paper on like what makes uh, uh, an effective like tool for thought and like how do you how do you create um, software that allows for this type of like connected and um, more like rhizomatic style thinking. Um, and they published in the course, which is really cool. Um, Another person did their PhD dissertation in Quartz, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and some people have done, yeah, a lot of people use DND, like put their DND wikis on there as well. I think, yeah, Quartz is, uh, Obsidian in general is very popular for people who run Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. So Quartz as a proxy just gets a lot of that. <laughs> mm. um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of people who do like video game lore. Um, type wikis as well. So like very like wiki and information heavy websites generally uh, on Quartz. Yeah. It's, it must be so satisfying and cool to, to, ha to work on this project that is just kind of leveling up the information of the world and, and, and really making knowledge more accessible. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a really, yeah, it's a really interesting way of putting it. I think it was always like a, my philosophy for working on open source has been like, oh, I would have liked this tool anyway, so I'll make it. Um, and it's always just like really wonderful to see other people really enjoy using the same software that I end up making. Um, it always just, yeah, just like warms my day when people like are like, oh, this is like I used Quartz to make this really cool thing that I share with other people. And yeah, it's, it's a really awesome experience. And I think a lot of like open source can be really difficult sometimes, but I think there's a lot of experiences like these where it's like people make genuinely cool stuff because of the work that you make public. Mm -hmm. That really makes a lot of it worth it. Yeah. Oh, magic. So let's, uh, let's talk about the future of courts. What's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What's in the, in the cards for the next year? What's in the cards? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, courts for right now is currently at a place I'm, I'm pretty happy with. Uh, there's like, I don't foresee any like large scale major rewrites coming in the close future. There's obviously a lot of like polish stuff that still needs to happen. Um, there, yeah. So like the two like major things off the top of my head right now is like dead link detection and like smarter hot reload. Um, the way courts kind of does hot reloading right now is it, it kind of tries to a little bit more context here is like Quartz has like a three-step build pipeline when it comes to building Quartz. 
Um, there is the transformer step, which kind of transforms any markdown note um, into uh, HTML. And then there's the filtering process that kind of removes unwanted notes from your process, uh, from your emitted website. And the emitter plugin, which takes these this like list of HTML files and produces actual files out of it. So actual HTML, JavaScript, CSS, whatever. Um, and the way Hot Reload works right now in Quartz is um, it re, uh, retransforms whatever file you've just edited and then reruns both the filter and emitter plugins on all the content. So if you have a really, really big, like 10,000 node fault um, and you make a change to like one or two files, um, the build process is like not as long as if you were to rebuild it from scratch, but it's also not ideal either. So there's a lot of really cool uh, theories about like dependency tracing we can take from compiler design that I think will really up level like courses hot reload speed. Um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so it's like, and not a lot of people have complained about courses performance so far. So it's like when I need the extra hit, I'll go for it. But yeah, um, <laughs> it's not top of mind right now. Um, it's really cool to kind of just like see it's like course four wasn't super designed for performance from the outset, but to my knowledge, I think it's like one of the fastest JavaScript static site generators out there. Um, just because of how we do concurrency. Um, which is really neat. <laughs> um, it's just like good to have fast stuff. Um, there's I'm, a larger. Oh yeah, go ahead. I, I imagine some people have huge uh, like amount of notes in Obsidian that they're exporting to. Um, yeah, like, like how does that work? The export from Obsidian to Quartz. Yeah, yeah. So Obsidian has a specific like markdown flavor. Um, so the way. Uh, Quartz's transform process. It has this three-step process, and we have a specific. Um, we you kind of hook into this uh, parser ecosystem called Unified, which provides two sub ecosystems called Remark and Rehype. Mm -hmm. So Remark is a JavaScript library that allows you to parse Markdown into an abstract syntax tree, uh, which allows you to kind of like visualize the Markdown as a tree, um, and then do transformations on it pretty easily. Um, and then rehype uh, is uh, an abstract syntax tree representation of HTML. And there's kind of this adapter layer that allows you to transform the markdown syntax tree to an HTML syntax tree. Uh, and that's kind of like where the bulk of the magic happens. Uh, and the really fun part about Quartz uh, transformer plugins is they operate directly on the abstract syntax tree level. Uh, so we have this uh, Obsidian flavored Markdown transformer plugin that takes in this Markdown tree that uh, Obsidian supports and kind of like sanitize it down into regular Markdown. Um, so we're effectively transforming Obsidian specific Markdown into regular plain old Markdown that any other Markdown parser will understand. So there's some specific Obsidian flavored syntax like Wikilinks, which is like that double square bracket syntax. We just turn those into regular markdown links, for example, um, and do a lot, of, a lot of other like syntax down leveling stuff Interesting. there. Um, so then we get this resulting clean to markdown tree, and then we convert it into an HTML syntax tree. And then we do one actual next step to convert the HTML syntax tree to JSX, which is a JavaScript templating language for JavaScript uh, that allows users to write components um, for displaying quartz information much more easily. Uh, it's much more readable than Hugo templates, I think. And a lot of people have kind of really enjoyed using that, especially if they come from like a traditional web development background of writing React. It's mm. quite like a familiar syntax for people. Um, so yeah, so we do that HTML to JSX transform, and then we use uh, like a, the built-in runtime uh, renderer to kind of render the JSX to uh, HTML again at build time. Um, so that's kind of like the whole end-to-end -end process of like how you transform like an Obsidian file into HTML. Um, this, and then obviously there's a bunch of other stuff around how to inject CSS and JavaScript afterwards, but it's a, it's a complicated process. Wow, so <laughs> powerful. Yeah, no, really interesting. Yeah. I, um, I, I cut off your answer before you were, you were just saying one more thing about the future of, of, um, yeah. Ah, course performance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's actually two more things. Okay. So uh, 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 one of them is um, 
like the the unified parsing ecosystem of remark and rehype is great but it is in javascript um and there's only so much the node v8 uh like jit optimizer can do so for those who are unaware like the the node javascript runtime um is powered by the v8 javascript engine which has this type of uh, optimization called JIT, which is just-in-time compilation. Um, so what it does is it finds any function that's been running a lot and then compiles that down to machine code, which runs a lot faster than in trying to interpret JavaScript code. Uh, V8 is actually pretty good at optimizing most programs, um, especially when it comes to um, like unified parsers, where effectively you have running the same function for a lot of different data. Um, in computer science, this terminology is like called SIMD, right? Like sim single instruction, multiple data. So you're taking the same function and running it over a lot of different types of data. Um, and V8 is actually surprisingly really good at optimizing a lot of this, but it still doesn't get native performance. Um, there is a future where, you know, obviously it's really hard to write uh, a spec compliant markdown parser. So I think rewriting one in like something that's lower level, like Rust or C or something like that would get like a really big speed bump out of courts. About like 40% of the compilation time for courts right now comes from uh, this markdown parsing step, not even the transforms. So I think we can get a really big win there. Um, the second biggest gripe I'd like to fix at like courts five or something in the future is uh, having uh, like a, a, a more islands based hydration approach. Um, the way Quartz kind of delivers uh, dynamic payloads right now is that uh, as a component, like a person who writes components, you would have to kind of write the raw JavaScript by hand and then do component dot after DOM loaded or something and then include the tag, uh, include the script that you just wrote. Um, and it's it works. It's not the most ergonomic solution. Um, the way like React and Preact and other um, JSX runtimes kind of do it is it allows you to write, you know, your your uh, payload code within the component itself using like hooks like use effect or use state or whatever, um, and then React figures out how to compile that into a JavaScript payload that you inject onto your page. Um, yeah, I it didn't work well with Quartz because of how Quartz hot reload works. So there's a lot of like really weird details around how Quartz is a self bootstrapping. Um, compilation target. <laughs> um, so Quartz like has a stub that calls a compiler to compile itself and then runs its own compiled version, <laughs> uh, which makes a lot of this JavaScript uh, bundling stuff really, really difficult. So yeah, at some point I'd like to revisit that, just like make the ergonomics of it a little bit better. But mm. uh, it's, yeah, it works right now. So <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing that would be like it would make a huge difference to the power user and that if someone has a, a lot of notes, like the, the particularly that the markdown parser and Rust would make a big difference. But probably yeah. like 95% of Quartz users wouldn't notice, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's like uh, the Quartz runtime stat right now is like on a decently modern machine, you can parse roughly 5,000 notes in like 15 to 20 seconds, which is like... I don't know if you're coming from like Jekyll or any other yeah. older stacks to enter, like that's pretty much unheard of. Right? Yes. <laughs> uh, for most people, it's like a very reasonable speed that it runs at. Obviously, there's people who like, if you enable more advanced features like fetching last modified date from Git, for example, that involves a lot more like traversing the file system and doing other stuff. Um, it gets a lot more expensive. Um, and we saw a user recently, they uh, have like a 9,000 note vault that takes them roughly 15 minutes to build. <laughs> so yeah, it can get pretty chunky at times. So those, that's like performance stuff that we're aware of, but <laughs> Got it. Yeah. hard to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Not oh, cool. Um, Jackie, so thanks for joining us today. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I was excited to find courts and I, and kind of introduced the idea to me of uh, digital gardening it it really resonates me and i think we need a lot more of that in the web and it's uh it just it it's a project that is having like a profound impact on the web it's uh i'm really happy that you're working on it yeah for sure thanks for yeah having me on and advocating for more of this type of work it's like really awesome to i think 
yeah, a lot of, I think, open source people are very often under the radar because it's just like the work is, there's not a lot of chance to publicize it. And I think just like platforming more people who are working on this sort of thing is just really awesome. So yeah, thanks again for hosting me on and having this podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie.